Ida has a feature that I happen to really, really like, and that is uh, built-in support for sets as well as operations upon them, such as membership tests. And uh, there is actually even a way uh, to do things like set unions and set differences. Now, uh, this isn't super obvious, and it's not something that most other programming languages even have, so it's not really something you'd look for or try to seek out uh, in most cases. Uh, that being said, uh, let's get into showing how this is actually done. Uh, now I need to create a file, so let's just do let's just do an example program, and I can have everything in there. Uh, we'll need some text I/O stuff, so let's bring that in now. And I'm going to show this off uh, just with a simple membership test at first. So let's do... Uh, I'll use the same example I used in the Add Introduction video. So that was if 5 is in uh, 1 through 10. And obviously it is. Compile this. And if we run it, of course it does say that 5 is within 1 through 10, because it obviously is. Uh, this in and of itself is just sort of handy, but not super useful. It's not really what I'm talking about quite yet. Uh, so let me show how to actually assign a name to this to, to really make it uh, more of a set and not just a simple range. Uh, and that is actually done through a little bit of an overloaded keyword. Uh, if you did watch the Ada introduction video, you would have saw that membership tests can be done both on ranges and on types. Now, what we're going to utilize here is that for our this purpose, uh, subtype is still a type, and if we do a subtype, uh, and I'll just call it uh, set, and it still works, but now we actually have a name associated with which is handy. Now, this is still pretty limited and not what I would really consider sets. And the way the way you get a more serious, more developed set uh, is through an Ada 2012 feature called aspects, uh, specifically the predicate aspect. And so, if we do, I think we can just leave this here. Uh, let's do, let's do an odd set. Uh, so it'll be the same range, but we're going to put a predicate in here. Uh, now, if you're using NAT uh, specifically, and I am here, uh, what you can actually wind up doing is just predicate. Uh, I don't have highlighting for that because the it's a NAT specific thing. Uh, but otherwise, you can use either static predicate or dynamic predicate. Uh, we're going to have to wind up using dynamic predicate for this one. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about what each of those is uh, later on in this video. But for now, uh, just it'll be a dynamic predicate. And you write in the code to check for this. Now, checking for odd is going to be what odd set uh, mod uh, two, and an odd should uh, not equal not equal zero. What? What the fuck? 
Well then, it's an interesting syntax highlighting bug. Uh, set is oh yeah, because you need to change this as well. And of course, this makes sense because five is within one through ten, but it is also odd. If we copy this over, and this time we make it an even set, so this one should evaluate to zero instead of anything other than zero. Uh, we'll copy this again. And we'll differentiate it this time. Even. Okay. Oh. Come on. There we go. Okay. Now, just to see what happens if we comment this out. Nothing. Because even though 5 is within uh, 1 through 10, it is not even. And the predicate there is specifically checking for it being even. So you can view the odd set as being uh, 1, 3, 5, 5 uh, 7, and 9, while the even set is... Uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Obviously, 5 will be in this one, but not within this one. Now, this actually isn't the only use uh, for sets. We can do this with non numbers as well. And in fact, Basically, any. Uh, uh, I know for sure it's any discrete type. I'm not sure if it's any sca uh, any, what is it, any scalar type. Um, well, I'll show off the other discrete, which would be enumerations. Uh, I'm going to be doing it with character, and then we'll do a little bit of a test to see if it works with any other scalars. So this one, uh, we'll actually just do a character test uh, for now. So uh, if, and then C, and uh, character, then And of course it is. Um, again, just like with the numbers, this isn't super useful yet, so let's actually uh, do another subset. Sub type. Even though we are using it as a subset, we would uh, call it a subtype in that. Uh, so let's just do. Uh, well, nah, I don't want to combine two ranges at first, so let's just do lowercase. And then this would be is, uh, character range, and then A, oh, A through Z. Uh-oh. Oh yeah, because we're trying to put an uppercase C. So if we put in a lowercase C instead, this should actually work. There we go. Um,
So let's combine two different ranges here, because that'll be a different way to show off how to use the predicates. And uh, conveniently, in this case, it will actually be a way to show off static predicates. And then that gives me an opportunity to talk about them. So for this one we're going to do, uh, we'll convert this to the alphabet one. And it would be alphabet and uh, character range and a lowercase a through c. Or, uh, uh, I have no word wrapping, uh, so let's do, uh, let's just put that there. Did I? Um, we do this. There we go. I just added in more than I should have. Okay. Um, there we go. And let's test uh, if what one is in alphabet. And of course, that one shouldn't actually be true. And it's not. So the difference between static and dynamic predicates is basically, uh, with a static predicate, you can tell exactly what it is ahead of time. Uh, that is, it is statically evaluatable. It winds up being the case with this specific example because the range isn't going to change. You know, a character is already an enumeration that is established, and we're just checking if it was within two different sub ranges of the entire character enumeration. Uh, there's no um, computation going on that can change this. Uh, in a way, it is kind of like being functionally pure in that the result is always going to be the exact same thing. Whereas a dynamic predicate usually involves some kind of actual evaluation. Uh, that was the case before with the number check or even or odd because the uh, mod operator is in that case intrinsic but is a function that is actually being evaluated which it, that one is functionally pure, but we can't actually guarantee that just because it's a function call and it's possible to have impure functions in Ida. This makes it so it has to be a dynamic predicate. Now there's a little bit more actually going on there if you're very interested in knowing the difference between the two. It's described in the reference manual. Uh, but that description alone should cover 99.9% .9 of all situations you find yourself in there. Uh, but this shows off membership tests and actually defining sets of uh, you know different styles. Uh, let's show off how to actually do a union now. So if I split this up again into... Uh, Subtype lowercase is uh, I don't need the predicate for this, so just range.
that's pretty much it. The OR operator is a union. So if you want to define a new name to the union, you can put it there. Otherwise, you can just, well, it's, it's this. So just in lowercase or in uppercase. Um, oh, heh. And there you go. Now, I, this kind of shows off why I recommend actually assigning a name to it, because otherwise you've got to duplicate what you're checking for twice, and that makes it a little bit error prone. Uh, plus, it's much more wordy than just having in alphabet. So, it looks cleaner and it's actually less error prone if you have to t t tweak anything. And sometimes you forget to change all of the, the values you're checking. But that's a union. Then we have the uh, the difference. Checking for if it's a difference. No, 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 no. Wait. Um, we'll check if it's in one but not the other first. So for that, if we do. Uh, Vowel. And we'll need a static predicate for this one just because of how this is going to work out. Uh, so, vowel is a. Got one. That's embarrassing. And we won't worry about why this this gets the point across. So yeah, we want to check if it's uh, we'll do if it's a lowercase, but not a vowel. Which, I mean, we could just define a uh, consonant subtype as well. Uh, but then that doesn't show this off. So we want to do if C is in alphabet. Uh, I believe it's just and not C in vowel. Um... Oh, yeah, because of the operator precedence. Uh, so we do it like this. Yeah, C is an alphabet character. And if we replace this instead with uh, E, which obviously is a vowel, You can see that it doesn't actually evaluate this time, because while E is in the alphabet, it is also a vowel, and we're checking if it's not a vowel. Uh, but, so this is a little quirk that you do need to consider that I, I sort of forgot about here. The uh, not is normally a very high precedence uh, operator, so it's, it tries to apply it first, but we need to check the membership first, and then apply the, the not to the membership check. Uh, so just wrap up the membership check in parenthesis before the, uh, so that it does that first before the not. Um, Yeah, so this this would basically be a difference too. So if we do uh, subtype consonant uh, is character and then predicate, uh, we can do it would be um, 
consonant and uh, we need to put this after the alphabet consonant and alphabet uh, and not consonant and vowel so if we do if C and consonant. There, so we actually have a uh, difference written out as well. Uh, now there's what unions, differences, and there's one other set operation I believe I'm forgetting. Uh, junctions, I believe it's called. Uh, testing that it's sort of within two different sets. I think that's the one I'm thinking of. Uh, that should be pretty obvious in that just one of them isn't actually, uh, check, uh, one of them isn't actually negated. Uh, so if we do, uh, capital C instead, and, uh, in consonant and C, capital C, uh, is an uppercase. This would be C uh, is uh, uh, oh. and there we go. Uh, now let's actually play around with this and see just sort of how far we can take this. Um, first things first, I want to see if floats can actually be used here. Uh, and if floats can, then obviously fixed points can as well. Uh, so let's do... Um, I don't know. Float... Um, And, uh, oh, no, 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 wait, we're doing, uh, positive, so we can just do range, and, uh, 0 0.0 up through, uh, no, this will need to be 0, 0.0 plus, uh, float small, up through, uh, float last. And then if we try to do, uh, if, and, uh, I don't know, 2.3 and positive float, then... Uh, let's try this. works. Alright, that's nice. Uh, so a little bit of explanation of what's going on here. Uh, there's two attributes that are useful, well, three attributes that are useful for ranges in Ada. One is the range attribute, which returns the full range. But there's also first and last, which respectively turn, return the first and the last part of the range. In this case, since we're only interested in defining a new start for the uh, subtype, we only are interested in using the last attribute. The first, what we're doing here is, because uh, 0, 0.0 itself would not actually be a positive, that uh, would be part of the uh, sort of like natural floats, but not positive floats. So what we want to do, since we don't it wouldn't be practical to type it, but we're also not exactly sure what it would 
be uh, to type out is to take 0, 0.0 and add to it the absolute smallest amount uh, of difference that a float can support on this platform. And that's what small is. It returns the, the smallest uh, difference between values that that type supports. Uh, so with this, we have the, the closest value to zero, that is not zero, all the way up to the last that the float actually supports. So that is all positive floating to point types. So let's see if I can also, I, I, I think I might know a way to figure out if these are positive as well. Or not, not they're already positive, what am I thinking? Uh, to figure out if these are whole as well. Uh, so I think if we do uh, with dynamic predicate, and it would be something like, uh, Uh, you know what, never mind, because uh, we've pretty much seen what we want to do anyways. Uh, so that would really just be me nitpicking, um, the seeing how far I can go. Uh, clearly, uh, clearly uh, floating point types and fixed point types are actually usable as part of sets as well, which is really, really handy. Um, there's a lot of uh, special definitions of different types of floats, uh, like whether or not it's, uh, you know, infinitely repeating uh, rationals versus irrationals and other stuff like that. Uh, so this would give uh, yet another way of actually uh, using these. Um, I'm not sure... No, I believe that's all that would actually be able to be done. Uh, there is one more membership that I want to test. Uh, this wouldn't so much be a set. Um, well, it, it depends. I've seen some people implement sets like this. So let's actually do uh, type... Uh, I'm going to just do set is array. Let's do... I just want to see if this works. Yeah, that one doesn't. Um, so yeah, I, I have no reason to think that uh, set operations would be allowed on anything beyond the uh, scalar types, and given that it doesn't seem to work with the array, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure just anything that is a scalar type, so that is any integers, modulars, uh, enumerations, uh, floats, and fixed points, uh, you can use for sets, which does pretty much make sense. That fits with what you would expect. So, yeah, not. Not one of the most obvious features, but hopefully you can see how this is actually pretty useful. Uh, especially, um, it, it makes for some very sophisticated membership tests. So what would, in many other languages, be, you know, this plethora of uh, is uppercase, is symbol, is number, uh, is even, is odd, is prime, uh, can actually be just be done through a number of subtypes that are used as sets, which is very very clean, uh, elegant syntax. I, I really like this feature of Ada. So hopefully you found this video helpful. Please consider giving a thumbs up. It actually helps a lot with how YouTube does uh, video rankings and helping people find videos. Uh, the, the more thumbs up, uh, the more YouTube is likely to recommend this to other people. So it really helps out a lot. 
Uh, also consider subscribing if you haven't already. I try to do a lot of these videos. I know recently, uh, recently at the time of recording this, I've been remaking a lot of the old content I did in much better quality. Uh, yeah. It, it was kind of, yeah, before. <laughs> so, uh, have a good one, guys.